right, we're going to, well, we start by talking about Jesus Christ Furusato. Yep. <laughs> Furusato just means hometown. It's, uh, it's interesting because in Scripture, we think of Jesus' hometown as, as one of several places. He's associated, obviously, with uh, Jerusalem, where he's going to uh, end his public ministry on the cross. Uh, his birthplace was Bethlehem. His hometown was Nazareth. His base of operations was Capernaum. That's right. So he has several places that you could, uh, he could uh, claim were his uh, hometown. But uh, let's look at right now in uh, Mark chapter 6, and we're going to read the first six verses. Jesus left there and went to his hometown accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he came to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get, uh, get these things, they asked. What's this wisdom that has been given to him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters with us here as well? And they took offense at him. Isn't that interesting? They were amazed at what he said. There was nothing wrong with his teaching, but they took offense at him because isn't he just like one of the guys from our neighborhood? Isn't he just one of us? Don't we know his brothers? Don't we know his sisters? Jesus said to them, only in their own towns, among their relatives and in their homes are prophets without honor. He could not do any miracles there except lay hands on a few sick people and then heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. You know, it, it's really human nature to idolize the distant and to have contempt for the near. When you see a, when you see girls like uh, go crazy over a group like One Direction, you know, a little boys band, I always kind of chuckle to myself. And they look at those boys as if they're gods. Oh, they're so dreamy. I don't know if people say that anymore. But, uh, and you just know if they got their hands on one of those boys, if they really got one to actually marry them, it wouldn't change, take too long for that dynamic to change. Or should I say before they start trying to change that boy. Uh, it's easy to idolize somebody from afar. But when you get to know somebody, to still love and respect them, that's a little difficult. I think it's human nature uh, to, to, to look at somebody and say, wow, they're so wise, they're so intelligent, they're so good, but then think, well, they don't, on a personal level, they, that person doesn't have anything to say to me, or they can't help me, or they can't uh, teach me if you know them, on, on a, again, on a personal level. And he said just that, understand that distance, that difference. We were joking again just this week at my home. I told my girls, I should really learn to have a Scottish accent or a British accent, because anything I say... Today's message is the 10 principles of Jesus' ministry. Today is the 10 principles of Jesus Christ's ministry here on earth. And right away you think, wow, this is going to be good. You know, well, maybe not because my accent was so bad. But, <laughs> but I've been, I do it myself. You hear this British preacher just start, and all he has to do is say, turn to Mark 6. And you think, wow, this is going to be good. And it's just human nature that we idolize people from afar. And Man, I'll tell you what, this can tick a pastor out. I'm not saying that it's ever happened to me. You get in a guest speaker, and the people are, oh, this is so amazing. We've never heard things. And I, are you kidding me? We just <laughs> talked about this like four months ago, you know. And, and people come up. Finally, we get some, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> but, but no, it's human nature. To, to, to things that are distant, to think, oh, they're so wonderful, they're so awesome. But Jesus says, yeah, there's no honor for a prophet in his own home. There's no profit, uh, honor for a prophet in his hometown. And we need to be aware of these things uh, so that we're not controlled about it. I remember Dad, uh, when I was a teenager, Dad had some wise words for me. Uh, he wasn't being critical. He said, Dan, you're a teenager that means you're crazy. <laughs> he says, you've got chemicals and hormones, you're out of whack, so just keep that in mind. He said, keep that in mind when you think something is so important and so drastic. 
She said, it's probably not. And it really helped. Now, it didn't necessarily mean I got any better. But, I, but as I was being crazy, I knew, well, I'm probably acting this emotionally or this crazy because I'm a teenager. It, it just helps to be aware sometimes. And we need to be aware that of this human tendency to idolize people, put them on a pedestal when they're distant from us. But when you, when you close to somebody and spend time with them, the opposite, they said they were amazed at what Jesus taught. And then because they said, don't we know his brothers, don't we know his sisters, they took offense at him. Well, who does he think he is, right? And that's human nature. We don't want anybody to, be, to have something to say that we're not saying or to be more important than we are or what, what not. One other point, look at this. Jesus didn't need their approval. Did you notice that? He wasn't needy. He didn't need them to give him honor. He just kept teaching. Uh, however, however, he only did a few miracles there. He wasn't able to do much for these people because they didn't believe in him. First principle of ministry, and today's message is, by the way, 10 principles of Jesus' ministry. That just wasn't just done for, to display my incredibly inept British accent. Uh, the first principle of ministry is serve even when unappreciated. We don't, we don't serve, we're not God's instrument to bless people and to love on people and to try to bring Christ into life just when they say, oh, you're so wonderful, I'm so thankful. When you work with hurting people, hurting people, hurt people do hurt things. Bruised people often act as if they're damaged. In other words, often when you're hurting people that are when, when, I'm sorry, when you're helping people that are really hurting, you're not going to get a thank you. They're, they're really focused on their own pain, and they're not often in the place where they should be. They should, should they be more appreciative of the time you spent, the money you spent, all the effort you spent? Yeah, they should be. Well, but you know what? The reason you're helping them is because they're hurt. Hurt people do hurt things. First principle of ministry, you have to serve even when unappreciated. Still teach. Jesus taught. He healed, but honestly, uh, you can't do as much with somebody when they don't believe in you, when, not, when their hearts aren't open as you could uh, if they did. In the next uh, story that Mark relates, Jesus sent out his disciples. He sends them out in twos uh, to cast out demons to do his work. And he tells them, if the people in town don't accept you, if they don't listen to you, leave if you bring the message of jesus and nobody pays attention shake the dust off your off your feet shake the dust kick the dust out of your sandals there's a there's a sign a symbol that you had your opportunity i did my best now you will reap the consequences of your own choices if you share jesus and nobody wants to listen to you it's okay to move on second principle of ministry is realize you can't save everyone. Realize you can't save everyone. Now, that doesn't mean you write them off. This side of heaven, we don't write people off, but we only have a limited amount of life to spend. Now, if you're going to spend it on Gilligan's Island or ministry to this person, go ahead and spend it on this person. But if it means the difference between sharing the gospel with somebody who still might is more open, there's more opportunity there, or just keep hammering on this door that's not opening, then we, should, we, we need to realize we can't save everyone. Don't use your time, don't use your life trying to save hard-hearted people that aren't open. And I was blessed. I, I had this, minist this taught to me by a, a legendary uh, missionary in Japan. He came right after World War II, spent his whole life there. I got to meet him. I, I spent time at his house and knew his family. And he said, Dan, uh, spend time with people. But if they're not open... But don't let them monopolize your time because there are other people that will be open and you need to share Jesus Christ with as many people as you can. And I've kept that with me. Now you try to love everybody, try to bless everybody, but you have to prioritize. And one of the ways you prioritize is who's receptive. How do you know who's receptive? Well, you share the gospel with people. You, you, don't, you don't find that out by trying to be sneaky. You lay it out there. I really hope you come to know Jesus Christ. Uh, my, my desire, the reason I've spent time together is because I, I, I want you not only to get your life together, I want you to know Jesus. I want you to get saved. I want you to go to heaven. 
And so you lay that out there and you see where people are at. So first principle, you serve, when, uh, you serve even when unappreciated. Second principle is you have to realize you can't save everybody. Sometimes we try to love people. We want to do good. We want to share the kingdom. We want to start a church in a community. Uh, and that community doesn't want it. People don't want it. It's okay to move on. It's okay to say we gave this our best effort time to move. That's, that's not failure. That's moving on to, to riper fields. That's just the way it is. There's also a good discipleship principle in this story. Jesus didn't train his disciples to work where he was or to do his work. He didn't ask them to preach when he was there to preach. He trained them so that they could go and work where he wasn't. You cover more ground that way. Do you understand? You cover more ground. This is a good model for, for the church, too. We all need to be witnesses. We all need to serve. Every, every hand on deck, every member, a minister. We need to, in order to reach our community, we need everybody serving in that capacity to reach out with the gospel, reach out with the love that God's put in our heart. We need to love other people. The question is, in this old traditional model of church, when I say old, it's younger than this. Jesus Christ sent out the 70, he sent out the 12. The original church was supposed to equip people to do every, act, uh, every good deed. But somewhere along the lines, Christianity got confused. And we got this idea that you have, you, we have support missionaries, and they go overseas. That's good support. But they, we, we had the idea that they're missionaries. Then evangelists, we support evangelists. We got the idea, well, they're evangelists. And we have a pastor. Usually a church would have one. Our church believes in a plurality of elders. We want to have a, a pastoral team. But you'd have this idea that you just send money and then you don't do these things. That model, and you know I'm not, I don't like to be critical of other churches, but that model is not biblical. The biblical idea is that we train people to go out and reach more people. We're all supposed to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Jesus, Jesus Christ can be known in our community because we're going to go out and hug people. We're going to go out and speak the truth. We're going to go out and love people closer to Jesus. Everybody has a responsibility to go out and share. This is the third principle. Teach others so that we multiply our outreach. Will we have one person sharing their faith, just the person standing up in front? Or will everybody in this church have a burden? I want to see people in heaven. I want to see my coworkers. If I don't tell my coworkers about Jesus... Is it going to be Larry or Mo or Curly? Who's going to go tell them about Jesus? See, the young people don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> we say this all the time. Your workplace, your school, don't come to me and say it's God forsaken. Jesus puts you there. If you are there, the light of heaven is shining through you. No neighborhood is God forsaken as long as we have uh, people that are loving Jesus there and learning to love other people and share the gospel. Third principle, teach others so that we multiply our outreach. That's what we do every Sunday. Everybody, all hands on deck. Next, Mark tells us how King Herod cut off John the Baptist's head because John the Baptist said that Herod, King Herod was wrong to steal his brother's wife. Well, yeah. From this we learn that one, these are not principles, but just things we learn here, uh, a godly man or woman is going to speak truth to power. Uh, Jesus Christ, no respecter of men. We don't, we don't cower underneath power or authority. We speak the truth to everyone. And number two, sometimes you get your head cut off for speaking the truth. Sometimes a person who is loving God enough to speak truth to power gets his head cut off. In this life, this life is not fair. This, the scales balance in heaven. In this life, sometimes good people die young. In this life, sometimes you have trouble at work. Sometimes you'll, you'll, you'll have trouble in your family or friends because you care enough to bring Jesus to the situation. Brothers and sisters, don't be, don't be this stereotypical Christian that is always has a bunch of cliches, has no heart, and just wants to ram their culture down somebody's throat but doesn't actually love anybody. Love people and then open up your mouth care about people and then open up your mouth and if you don't love and if you don't care just stay silent but all of us all of us all of us 
need to love and care enough to share Jesus Christ. Uh, let's look at Mark chapter 6 now, 30 through 34. Mark chapter 6, 30 through 34. And here we're going to get principles 4, 5, and 6 from this passage. Uh, principles that Jesus used in his ministry that we use by example. When I studied this section, uh, I told Yumi, this is a little scary. I usually know before I finish my first sermon or, or by Monday or Tuesday what I'm going to be preaching about on next Sunday. This time I read it and it was Saturday and, <laughs> and I didn't know what's in here, what's in here. And then I realized there's a lot of examples of Jesus serving, and he's giving us examples of how to serve. And I went through there, and I thought, wow, there are really just 10 principles on how to serve, how to be Christ-like in the way we reach out to other people. So in this section, we're going to see 4, 5, and 6 from verse 30. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, your translation might say they had no leisure, not even leisure to eat. He said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a crowd so large, he had compassion on them. Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. By this time, it was late in the day, so his disciples said to him, there is, this is a remote place, he said. And, oh, I'm going too far now. That's the next story. Let's get away and rest, principle number four. Sometimes it's necessary to rest in order to do our best work. Sometimes you just need to take a break, otherwise you get burnt out. Uh, fifth principle of ministry Ministry often isn't convenient. What, what did Jesus plan to do? Go and get some rest. And what happened? He got on shore, and there's this huge crowd of people. And he looks at them, and he didn't say, oh, man, I just need to take a rest. I haven't even eaten supper day. He looked at them and said, wow, they're like sheep but without a shepherd. Their lives are messed up. They're running in every direction. The Bible says he taught them many things. He wanted to bring the truth of God into their life. It's all about, uh, ministry often isn't convenient. Real life takes place at inconvenient times. And this, the timing, by the way, is never right for disaster. You get that phone call you don't want to have, trouble in the church that you're disappointed or sad to hear about. Don't tell yourself, oh, if only it would. No, it's never going to be convenient. It's never going to be good time for these difficult situations. And one of the most important things taught to me, I was at a conference very early on. I think it was Pastor Bill Hybels down near Chicago, and he was telling this story, <coughs> and he said, he said, if I could tell young pastors, young Christians anything, I'd want to tell them real ministry is often unplanned and inconvenient. When we have an opportunity to speak Jesus into somebody's life, it's not always at the set Bible study times. Real ministry takes place often during family time often when you're too busy with work, often when you've got a lot of things on your plate already. Sometimes you haven't even had supper yet. Real ministry often takes place. A disaster often comes when we wouldn't have planned it otherwise. Uh, verse, from verse 34, it says, let me get there again. When Jesus landed and saw the large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. The principle here, principle number six, is all about compassion. How many people here, when you heard that, say, Lord, too often it's all about me, or all about my family, or all about what I need? How many people here think maybe we got to pray and say, Lord, break my heart. Help me to love other people. Do I really love those irritating neighbors? Do I really love the people, my family members that are always getting on my case? Do I really love this coworker who's gossiping about me? I, Lord God, break my heart because if my heart's not broken, I'm not useful to you. Lord, help me to have compassion. People are not the enemy. Satan is the enemy. He wants to destroy lies. He wants to take the image of Christ in your life. He wants to erase it and rub it out. 
Jesus died for that person you can't stand. That person who cuts you off on the road, Jesus loves them. Jesus died for them. Jesus cares about the people that we want to write off. It's all about compassion, and we're not Christ-like unless we're learning to love. And so often, Lord, my heart is hard. Lord, my heart is critical. I'm so judgmental. I keep putting myself on a pedestal. What do we say? Our butts are not big enough to sit on the judgment seat of God. The throne is for the king. Seeing people that need love. People need love. They need truth. And by the way, Christian, it's okay to be needy in this sense. Not to wallow in pity and to say, I need love. I need truth. Lord, I need your closeness. It's more than okay. We should be desperate for the closeness of God. We need direction. And Jesus saw all this, and instead of seeing people as contemptible, ever been there? Instead of seeing people as contemptible, he sees them as people that need to be blessed. This is always a difficult lesson. Several years ago, though I think God, honestly, I struggle with a lot of things. I think God has put love in my heart. I, I love people. I always have a heart for people. I want to see people go close to Jesus. But you know what? A few years ago, I went through a really hard time, and the leadership team knows about this. And I, I stood up in front and gave some difficult sermons. Say, wow, I'm dry today. This is difficult for me. Uh, and God really broke my heart, and I knew what the problem was, and it still took months to work through it. I was, I'm not going to say I wasn't loving people. That wouldn't be true. But trying to get the right sermon, to say the right thing when you're counseling, there's such a burden to be able to be a blessing to people's life. All these different things, and I was trying to do the right things, and it was coming home to me. I needed my heart broken again to just love people. Lord, I just want to love everyone in the church. I want to love the lost. When somebody says something about me I don't like in the church, Lord God, help me to win their heart. Help me to just love them. Our response should be to everybody in our church. They're our brothers, our sisters. Listen, listen, please. If your sister or brother in Christ, you're both Christians, you're going to be stuck with them for eternity. How can we justify not making every effort to get along now? It's about compassion, understanding our need to be loved and understanding other people's needs as well. And this was really, this is a lesson I have to keep learning again and again. It doesn't have to do with how polished the sermon is. It doesn't have to do with how beautiful our facilities are, how awesome the worship team is. The question is, in our church, do we love God? Do we love people? <coughs> Excuse me. And if you attend this church and you were sitting there saying, yeah, does this church love me enough? You got it wrong. You got it wrong. Brothers and sisters, if you're here, I want you to be asking the question, how can I love the people around me more? What can I do to show compassion? <coughs> Excuse me. Don't just sit here and ask if other people are loving me enough. Are they uh, compassionate enough with me? If this is your church, I want you to ask, am I loving to others in my church? And how about outside of the church? Lord God, does my heart break? Do I have compassion for lost souls outside the church? Please. Children? Adults? Men? Women? Ask yourself, Do I care that people are sleepwalking on their way to hell? I am somebody who ne continually needs my compassion. I remember going to Japan, and, and many of you know the story, how, I, how I, I never thought about being a missionary, and I was praying really hard, what should I do after college? And I had this dream that I was on an airplane going to Japan. and, <coughs> and uh, Hadn't been on an airplane since I was a toddler, and, and I woke up in bed, and 
in my dream, I felt so scared and sad about when the airplane took off. I'm totally separate from my family and my culture, everything. And the next moment, I just had this resolve. I'm going to tell people about Jesus. I want to help Japanese people get to heaven. And I sat up in bed, and I was, it was bright out, and I was in my dorm room at Trinity College. And I looked out the window, and this is so weird for me because I'd never thought to be a missionary. I put my hands, my face in my hands, and I just cried because I wasn't gone yet. I needed to be gone. And, and you guys know the story how I told Dad. He came down, and we were in Illinois. He was driving, and I said, Dad, I, I know this is going to be a surprise because I've never talked about this before. I've never even thought it before, but I think I'm going to be a missionary overseas. And I thought Dad would try to talk me out of it. Like, that's a big commitment. you got to be serious. you got to think. Dad didn't say any of that. And I realized I had underestimated how badly he wanted me out of the country. <laughs> and, and Dad immediately is driving. I can remember he said, yeah, I think that's a good idea. You should go. <laughs> And I got to Japan, and I'm a missionary, right? I'm going to tell people about Jesus. And my Christian boss, who was a good, godly man, started to really irritate me. And I was staying at his house. I hadn't, didn't have my apartment yet. And life is difficult, and I'm feeling like, I'm not telling you. Why, why am I even here? And I remember I sat down at his kitchen table. He and his wife and son, who was my friend from college, that's how I got the job, they were gone. And I said, God, please break my <laughs> Couldn't even finish the sentence. And, and God just melted my heart. My attitude before and after that, I'm here because I want to love people to Jesus. That's why I'm here. And it changed my perspective when God broke my heart. we got to pray that again and again and again. Sisters, brothers, children, pray that God breaks our hearts. We need compassion. We need to care about people because we're not going to make sacrifices for the kingdom without compassion. And by the way, without compassion, our whole lives are oriented on ourselves. And, and we just feel like, what are my needs? Why, why, am I needing, why are my needs not being met? And when we feel like we've been done wrong, when we feel people haven't loved us, respected us enough, we're capable of all sorts of craziness. Compassion is the key. Love First for God with everything in our hearts and loving other people is the key that frees us from the tyranny of self. The sixth principle is compassion. We serve in our church, not just so our church can grow physically, not just so we can be a cool church. We serve out of compassion. People need Jesus. People need the cross. Without the cross, there's no forgiveness of sins. Without the cross, people are lost. The seventh principle of ministry is about this freedom story of the 5,000. Again, in Matthew, we covered all these things in detail. And Mark, Mark moves fast. We're moving fast. The seventh principle of ministry, feeding the 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish, the lesson here is that what is impossible with man is possible with God. There are things we cannot do on our own. That's no reason not to go do them. We need to ask God. We need to seek God. We need to pray. Nothing is too big for God. That's the point. If we can do it without God, then it's not a God thing. Everything should be a God thing because we need to be doing it in the power of our Lord. Nothing is too difficult for Jesus. Go forward in faith. God can do what we can't do. Brothers and sisters, God can do what we can't do. I can't tell you how many people, Adam, I'm going to pick on you again. So many people, the week, the month before they became a Christian, people have told me there's no way that person's ever going to get saved. So many people, at one point it looked impossible, and now they're living their lives for Jesus. Don't tell us it's impossible. We worship a Lord where all things are possible. You know that 5,000, oh, we think, oh, that's such a big miracle. That's small. Everything is small for God. The eighth principle is Jesus broke the bread. You remember what he did? He gave thanks to our Heavenly Father. The eighth principle of ministry is thankfulness. Thankful people are powerful tools in God's hands. Ornery, bitter, complaining people rarely get anything done for the kingdom. The eighth principle of ministry is to be thankful. 
Jesus Christ modeled thankfulness for us. We need to be thankful ourselves. Thankfulness. The next episode uh, records, uh, that Mark records gives us our two final principles of ministry for today. Let's look at Mark chapter 6 from verse 45 to 51. Mark chapter 6 from verse 45. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat. There's that word immediately that Mark keeps using. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get in the boat and go ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. When evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on the land. He saw, by the way, they should have been across the lake long ago. It was taking them a long time. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass them by. When they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed. Ninth principle of ministry here, look what Jesus did. He took time to be alone with God. You've heard pastors say this again and again. I've said it before. If Jesus needed to take time to be alone, who do we think we are that we think we can do our Christian lives without spending time with God? We need to take time to pray, take time to read our Bibles, take time to be alone with the Lord. Principle 10, when life gets terrifying, we need to remember that it's the presence of Jesus that casts out fear. I don't think we can be terrified when we're in the, other than the fear of God when we're in the presence of Jesus. We need to recall his words, it's all right, don't be afraid, I'm here. Life can be a big storm. Life can scare us. The things that come our way can be terrifying. Get close to Jesus. Draw close to Jesus. Don't forget that Jesus is with us. It's all right. I'm with you. Don't be afraid. It's all right when, life, when the winds blow. Jesus is the one who commands a storm. It's all right when life seems out of control. Nothing is outside of God's control. When life gets terrifying whether it's those creaks in the night, whether it's that phone call you don't want to have, whether the rug's been pulled off from underneath you because friends and family you thought you can depend on aren't there for you. When life gets scary, draw close to Jesus. He said, it's okay. Why? Because I'm with you. Life is unpredictable. It's okay. Because Jesus says, I'm with you. Hebrews 13.5 says, make sure. Now, when the Bible, this is a technical term, when the Bible says make sure, what we're supposed to do is make sure. <laughs> make sure your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. Jesus is saying, hey, guys, I'm enough. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> Don't you feel like that sometimes? Jesus says, I'm all sufficient for you. And you say, no, you're not. Well, you know what? He's good. He loves us anyways. But that's not the way a relationship is supposed to work. Jesus is our all in all. And we want to say, no, you're not. And remember how in the book of Matthew ended, Matthew 28, 20, the, the Great Commission? Jesus said, teach them to observe everything that I commanded you. Make disciples. Teach them to obey everything I commanded you. He said, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. When is Jesus going to leave us? Are you a believer in Jesus Christ? When is Jesus going to leave you? The answer is never. Jesus will never leave you alone. He's never going to abandon you, abandon you. He's with us in the storm, but sometimes we've got our eyes closed. When you say, God, open my spiritual eyes. Let me know that you're with me because life is so hard right now. I need to know you're with me. I need to know that you're close. It's a big job. This life is scary. To go and make disciples of all people, to reach out, to take steps of faith, to go outside of our comfort zone, to try to win more souls to Jesus Christ, these jobs, they're too big for us and they're scary. We need to know, Jesus said, I will be with you always, 
even to the end of the age. So brothers and sisters, let's get out there and start making disciples. That's what Jesus commanded us to do. Ten principles of ministry if we want to do it like Jesus. These are things I have not mastered. These are things I struggle with. But I see Jesus and I see his ways. They're better than my ways. I want to be, I want to serve like this. And I want our whole church to have hearts like this. To have the compassion of Jesus Christ. To boldly teach uh, the word of God no matter what. Let's pray. Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, the job is too big. I feel the weakness of my words even as I speak them, Lord, to change lives, to draw people to you, to inspire people, to take bold steps of faith, to go outside their comfort zone, to, to make painful sacrifices, Lord, with their time and their finances. Lord, These are this is too big, and nothing we do at church is strong enough, Lord. Father, help us to lean into you, to lean in close. Lord, I pray for myself, for Dad, for our deacons, Jerry and Aaron, for those who serve on our leadership team in various capacities, for our Sunday school teachers, Lord, for our small group leaders. Lord, those who, who serve in men's ministry, women's ministry, all the different things that we have going on, Lord, for every single one of us. Help us to lean in close to you, Lord. So close we can feel your breath on our faces, Lord. We, we can't have separation between us. We're so weak on our own. We're so desperate on our own. We're so inept on our own. We can't accomplish anything. We get, we get overwhelmed with selfishness and self-righteousness and bitter judgmental hearts, Lord. And we, we stumble all over the place, Lord. We need to be close to you. We need to know that you are close, Lord, to accomplish this huge mission you've given us. Help us to embrace your mission, Lord, your cause, your great commission. You told us to go out, to go out and make people disciples, teach them to obey, baptize them in your name, the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, let that be true of us. And Lord, I pray that even with our children, our teenagers, our tweens, our little kids, Lord, please impress on their hearts and on their souls, Lord. Let them be hungry to see people know Jesus. I pray that they dream about seeing the church grow, that they dream about seeing their friends won to Christ, that they dream about being able to share Jesus Christ with others. Lord, we don't want to be afraid of men. We don't want to be afraid of the storms around us. We don't want to be afraid of the size of the mission you've given us because we just want to fear you, Lord, and draw close to you. Lord, please remind us that you're never going to abandon your flock, that you look down at your sheep and you have compassion. Father, let your cause be our cause. The things you love, I pray that we love them. The people you died for, Lord, I pray that we will lay down our lives to share this gospel with everyone we can. Father, please bless us. Please bless us by using us in our community, Lord. We're here. We want to be instruments in your hand. Please use us, Lord. Please bless us. We pray in your name. Amen. Thank you for watching Foundation TV. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.